good evening everyone and uh, good morning to professor sim maglur uh, and few others who will be joining us uh, from the different time zones so on behalf of my colleagues i welcome you all to the ig founders day celebration i am indrila de i will be co-hosting this event with professor mosumi das i am delighted to welcome professor darul asim maglur institute professor mit who will deliver this year's founders day lecture shortly we also have with us mr nk singh chairman 15 finance commission and one of our trustees welcome again at ig mr singh Thank our you. chairman mr tarun das and our director professor ajit mishra are also present in the panel before we start i would like to remind you that this is uh, in webinar mode so all the communications have to go through the chat box below we might have some time left at the end of the lecture for questions uh, question and answers so if you have any please uh, write it down in the q and a box without further delay i will now invite professor mishra to deliver his welcome note thank you okay well thank you anjula uh, it will be a quick affair i don't want to stand between you and darun uh, again uh, morning darun uh, good afternoon to participants in the uk and good evening uh, all, all all those present here uh, uh, Welcome to the Founders Day lecture. Now, this is not the way I had planned the Founders Day lecture. You know, especially after the last one, which was so close and interactive and such nice sunny weather. Lunch, you missed something, Darren. Excellent lunch. Now, <laughs> but you know, there we are. Uh, we have to do it the best uh, that we can. Now, as you know, just uh, quickly, a couple of lines about the Founders Day. You know, IG, as some of you probably already know. Uh, started as the Delhi School of Economic Society way back in 1952 on uh, 14th November. Okay, so we tried to do a Founders Day lecture around that day. Uh, 14th being Diwali, so so you know 16th uh, fell on uh, Darren's uh, uh, diary as the Founders Day lecture day. And you know we I believe that it's an occasion for us to reflect on the legacy and draw inspiration to move forward because IG has occupied. For you know, number of years, several decades, a central place uh, in research and uh, policy advice, and you know we are striving to maintain or continue that excellence, commitment to excellence and independence. Uh, we have with us uh, Professor Darren Asimoglu, as Andrila pointed out, Institute Professor, and that is, uh, as some of you might know, that's an honor bestowed on someone. Uh, who has demonstrated exceptional distinction? You know, I'm not going to read out the whole uh, thing from the MIT website, but that essentially signifies uh, excellence, okay, in a, in, a, in a true sense. So we are uh, thank you, Darren, for for taking out the time. And we have also Mr. N. K. Singh, who, as uh, Mr. Das pointed out, gave the Founders Day lecture last night, and. Uh, if, if you remember, it was titled uh, uh, "Global Economic Landscape." Okay, and you know, if we now think back, yes, some of the structural problems continue to be the same, remain probably the same, but it has changed so much. And uh, so, in some sense, you know, today's title, uh, "Remaking uh, the Post-COVID World," is is an apt reflection on where we are going. As you may be aware, Dr. B. K. Arvira, our founder, was instrumental in starting and sustaining several institutions across the country. And he is rightly viewed by many as a great institution builder. So it's befitting that Darren Asimoglu, or the Founders Day lecture, is being given by Darren, who has brought back institutions to the center stage of any discourse on development these days. Uh, his 2001 paper with Johnson and Robinson on colonial origins of comparative development actually started a new agenda on research on role of institutions in economic development. And of course, there is now a sizable literature. Of course, his 2012 book, "Why Nations Fail," is already a classic. Now, he's someone who has combined scientific rigor with social relevance and a deep appreciation of history in a very, very admirable way. I've already mentioned his development papers, and as we, we are all probably familiar. But as economists, we are probably not familiar with you know his work. Uh, I, I I saw something in two thousand seven. He published a paper on generalized point care health theorem for compact non-smooth regions. So there you are. Uh, a, a truly uh, remarkable uh, 
researcher or scientist. In fact, high school's reading, I have personal experience because of my, you know, my own family. At the same time, PhD students also plow through his scientific papers. In fact, in my personal experience, I used his uh, Why Nations Fail in the first year, Modern World Economy, as kind of a uh, chatty reading. And I also used chapters from his Introduction to Modern Economic Growth in my final year uh, development course. And one chap, not more than one, but one had the courage to come up to me and ask, is it the same chap? Okay. Because the one he read in, in his first year. Uh, Darren's breadth has been amazing. Okay. And if you see his work, uh, it's, it's labor, human capital, technology, in particular technology change, inequality, growth, and of course, political economy. And all these areas have benefited from his pioneering contributions. Now, I'm going to share something uh, with you. Uh, and I hope uh, Dan, uh, Darren is not going to mind. Now, four years back, we had invited him to Bath, when, you know, the lovely city of Bath, when the university uh, conferred honorary doctor, uh, doctorate on him. And in fact, coincidentally, in the same month, we also you know, honored uh, Professor Kosifas, who might be joining if, if we are lucky at some stage. Now, so this is something uh, he won't know because, I mean, Darren won't know. So in the faculty, you know, among uh, colleagues, we decided, you know, what's the best way? We, we spend hours trying to figure out how best to introduce you, uh, Darren. You know, all those H index, the I10 index, the citation numbers and stuff like this. Okay. Now, I'm not going to commit the same mistake because it takes too much time. Darren, and it still, I believe, doesn't do justice to you. Okay. Rather, I'm going to narrate a small, you know, personal uh, thing, which I'm, you know, uh, Mosumi and I said, I'm, 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 I have taken mm. permission to share it. And uh, it's basically, you know, after, uh, you know, we agreed on the date, I wrote to the seminar team and saying that, oh, Darren is going to give our talk and blah, blah, blah. We fixed the date. We started planning. And then, you know, late one night comes a message on my WhatsApp saying, is Darren's talk before the Nobel Prize announcement or after the Nobel Prize announcement? Why? We figured out that it's going to happen after the Nobel Prize announcement. And we were very worried uh, that it's, it is so. Uh, because, you know, we felt that the prize would probably bring some, you know, pressing engagements and stuff like this. I know that Dara would have probably been honored. Okay. Uh, but we were kind of apprehensive that, you know, our lecture might be under threat. Sorry, Dara, we wish you well, but that was the self-interest uh, playing on our mind momentarily. Okay. Now, four years back when I heard you, the backdrop was just the concluded election in the U.S., if you remember. Uh, which many found very difficult to digest then. Now two elections have happened in the U.S., uh, but many questions still unanswered. The world has been reeling under the pandemic with leadership in various spheres, government as well as various institutions under the scanner like never before. The recovery path and the remaking of the post-COVID world is everybody's mind. So without wasting any more time, I would request you to share your thoughts. Over to you, Darren. Thank you very much, Ajit. That's a, a very touching introduction. And it's a, truly an honor uh, to be here for the Founders Day lecture. I'm sorry I cannot be there in person, but uh, of course, uh, Zoom is a, a second best or third best option uh, in the absence of being able to share uh, this day with you in person. Uh, it's it's a, it's a discombobulating time for all of us. And uh, I've been giving talks about this topic. And in fact, this title, Remaking the Post-COVID World, I have used a number of times over the last eight months. But the content has changed. I like the title, but the content has changed. And the content has changed in the following way that as time went by, my emphasis has shifted away from the disruption that the virus has caused, which of course is no mere matter, and India knows this better than most other countries, and we are still in the midst of the pandemic. But I believe that the future is even more challenging because of the pre-COVID fault lines. And in this lecture, I have decided 
to talk about one specific set of challenges which have been exacerbated by COVID and have then impacted various aspects of our lives. And one reason for doing that is because of the urgency of this topic. The second is because I believe these issues especially related to automation, AI, and technology are not sufficiently well appreciated in the developing world because their implications for the developing world are quite transformative as I'm going to try to argue. And then the third reason is because this actually brings together several lines of my recent research together, a lot of the work on technology, automation, inequality, its impacts on developing countries and political economy. So I'm going to try to speak for about 40 minutes and leave about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. Let me start with US data, because that's the one I know best, but I'll come back to the world uh, more generally in a second. Not all is well in the US, even when you look at several years before COVID. One aspect of this, perhaps the defining aspect of this, is what's going on in the labor market. On the left, I'm showing a natural inclusive measure of labor demand growth in the US. Private sector wage bill, employment in the private sector times average wage in the private sector. And between 1947 and 1987, in the four decades that followed World War II, you have a remarkable growth in the wage bill. It's growing about two and a half percentage points faster than population in real terms. This is the golden age of growth. And this growth in private labor demand was translating into wage growth. And that's why real wages in the US grew more than 2% a year during this period. And it's a pretty steady growth. On the right, I'm showing the same quantity, but in the last 30 years. And you see that it first slows down and then it flattens out that there is essentially no labor demand growth in the US from the late 1990s onward. The consequences of this have been truly sweeping. First, there has been a large decline in the share of labor in national income. Capital captures much more in the US and labor captures much less of GDP or national income. But my research also indicates that Wage inequality changes have been quite intimately linked to this slowdown in labor demand. This picture, some of you may have seen, it, is, it gives one aspect of the huge rise in inequality in the United States. So I'm showing the real wages, cumulative real wage changes of, uh, of 10 demographic groups by education. The top blue, line, dark blue line is postgraduate degrees. The light blue is college graduates, all the way to the bottom were workers with less than high school and men and women. And you see that in the 1960s, and the same is true in 1950s if you use other data sources rather than this one that I'm using here, that growth was broadly shared, a rising tide lifting all boats, that two and a half percentage point increase in labor demand was translating to more than 2% real wage growth for all 10 demographic groups. From the 1980s onwards, you see a big fanning out. Wage inequality is increasing. And even more consequentially, you see the real wages of low education men, those with high school degrees, less than high school degrees, even those of the gray area with, uh, uh, with, with two-year college degrees is actually declining in real terms quite substantially. And this has had major social consequences as of course everybody around the world is aware and is suffering some of the implications of those consequences of polarization, political backlash, discontent, and so on. Why? A complex phenomenon such as this has many causes. Globalization, the 
uh, erosion of labor market institutions protecting labor, especially low wage labor. Those are all very important. But my research uh, with Pascual Restrepo over the last 10 years has focused on the technological roots of what's going on. And in that research, and since time is short, I'm not going to go into the great, into great detail, but in that research, we have argued critically that the standard way that economists approach the effects of technology, both in the macroeconomy and in labor economics, let alone development economics, is uh, not sufficiently rich. Technology cannot and should not be thought of as just one single type of technology that benefits both output and labor. And in particular, it is critical to distinguish different types of technologies and especially central is automation versus other types of technologies. Some of the views among economists that are often loudly expressed that if you complain about the disruptive or the negative effects of technology, you're a Luddite, are based on this mistaken view of technology that all technologies work the same way. In fact, quite the contrary, technologies have very differing productivity and distributional effects because they do very different things. By automation, what we mean is technologies that take existing tasks that were previously performed by labor and mechanize them make them produced by machines, such as the mechanization of agriculture, such as the modern system of manufacturing uh, in, during the second industrial revolution, such as machine tools, such as numerically controlled machines, and of course, robots and increasingly algorithms and AI. So what Pasquale and I have done in our work is try to develop a conceptual framework for thinking about these different aspects of technologies, but also empirically investigate their implications. And I'll show you two slides on that. The first one essentially does a more macroeconomic approach and tries to say, well, let's try to decompose sources of productivity, employment, and output growth in the US economy across detailed sectors into automation and other types of technologies. And here I'm showing you two types of technologies that are particularly playing an important role in the US past. One is displacement effects of automation technologies. And the other one shown with the black line is what we call restatement. The reorganization of production, new technologies or new tasks that are labor intensive that reinstate labor centrally into the production process. So our research shows on the left, you can see, that between 1947 and 1987, there was a significant negative impact of this displacement due to automation on labor demand and a positive impact of the reinstatement coming from other technologies. But miraculously perhaps, well, actually our research explains why it's not completely miraculous, but, but somewhat remarkably, these two essentially canceled each other. So the sum of the two shown with the thick blue line, is hovering around zero, indicating that the impact of this broad class of technologies was neither a decline in labor demand nor an increase in labor demand because the two counterbalanced each other. And this is at the root of why productivity growth that was very rapid during this time period translated into a commensurate increase in labor demand and led to that 2.5% growth in private sector labor demand. But look at the right and you see a sea change. Now automation is going much faster. In 30 years, it's gone to uh, eliminate a 25 percentage percent uh, labor demand as opposed to 20% in four years. And the reinstatement effect has become much slower and as a result, the thick blue line in the middle is now heading south, explaining much of that very rapid slowdown that I've shown you. This is a little bit more macro, but it highlights these two different types of technologies. There are other types of technologies in the background, especially those that uh, you know, most economists emphasize, such as labor augmenting technologies, but those don't play much of a role, so I'm not even showing them. But since this is high level, let's look at 
more specifically what we mean by automation. So here is a quintessential example of automation, industrial robots. If you look at industrial robots, what they do, they have been designed ever since the early 1980s for some very specific tasks. So uh, engineers in the 1980s were actually extremely clear headed in what robots were supposed to do. And the manuals and the scientific articles that they wrote about industrial robots is exactly what they do today, 40 years after those articles are written. They are meant to automate some of the tasks that required both some medium degree of skill and, and manual dexterity, such as welding, painting, assembly, uh, and so packaging, and so on. So that's a very clear example of an automation. It takes away tasks from workers. So if you think of robots in the standard economic, the standard sort of uh, 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 neoclassical economic framework, you would expect they increase productivity. In fact, we find that they do have a fairly positive effect on productivity. They increase productivity, so they should increase labor demand and labor uh, labor compensation. But here it is, what happened in the US when you look at the effects of the robots between the early 1990s when they started spreading in the US economy to 2007, just before the Great Recession. On the horizontal axis, I have exposure to robots of different local labor markets, 200 and 720 commuting zones. And you can control for whatever you like in this regression, uh, this is a very, very robust result. So uh, I'm showing you with the most loaded controls, but that doesn't really matter for the message that I want to uh, sort of convey. And on the vertical axis, I have changes in private employment again between the same dates. What you see is that in places where you have greater exposure to robots, especially because they were performing tasks in specific industries, which were uh, seeing the most advances in robotics, you see very significant declines in employment relative to the rest. This relationship is not confined to, but is led by the industrial heartland of the United States, Detroit, Lansing, Muncie, uh, Cleveland, Toledo, etc. So these are actually not coincidentally, perhaps the places where the social angst, reaction, alienation, and political backlash have been strongest in the United States. Well, robotics may be the technology of today and yesterday. AI is the technology of tomorrow. Is AI different? Potentially, yes, because robotics from the very early on viewed as a very specific automation technology. Robots were not originally designed to complement humans or to create new tasks for humans. Today, there are things called cobot, co-robots, you know, it's, it's become richer, but robots were never a very broad technological platform. AI is different, it's a broad technological platform. You can do all sorts of things, create new tasks, augment humans, or automate humans, or automate tasks that were previously su supported by humans. I don't have time to go into it, but my research, recent research with David Adder, Pascal Restrepo, and Joe Hazel shows that AI adoption so far has been driven by the same business model, by the same approach, and it has gone quite far in substituting algorithm for humans and not very far at all in these other things that would have been like the reinstatement effect that I showed you two slides ago. Now, the danger from AI is of course much greater if it's misused because it will reshape all aspects of the economy and our social lives, including the functioning of democracy. So the question is who will control AI? Well, I'll come back to that question in a second but a lot of what I say will actually turn on that. So what I am therefore suggesting here is that for a variety of reasons, recent technologies have been much more biased towards automation and much less, put, put much less devoted to advancing other technological capabilities that are complementary to humans. Why has that been? I think there are several aspects to it. 
chief among them is the business models of many large companies that has focused on substitution, automation, and eliminating humans. If you look at big tech, their business model from the early days was about algorithms doing more and more and humans doing less and less. And they have become more and more dominant in setting the research direction of the US and the world. And I'll come back to the world again in a second. But I was going to say this in a second, but let me say that now. Today, for example, in the field of AI, which again might have very transformative effects on all of the world, two out of every three dollars spent on research and development comes from the large companies in the US and China. So who controls AI is very much about these com big companies. So that may have played a role. We don't know for sure. We have some circumstantial evidence, but we don't, know for, we don't know for sure. Global competition. U.S. firms have been perhaps understandably obsessed with cost reductions, and automation is one way of bringing cost reductions. Education system, let me not get into that, but let me mention the tax code. Actually, policy over this time period has also gone in the direction of supporting capital at the expense of labor. So here what I'm showing is results from some other recent research I have with uh, Andrea Manera and Pascual Restrepo on effective taxes that different types of capital and labor face. Labor has always been taxed more heavily than capital in the United States. The blue line at the top here shows effective labor taxes, which is payroll taxes plus uh, income taxes. It's about 25% for the last 40 years. Capital was taxed, especially equipment and software capital was taxed somewhere between 15 and 20% uh, in, the, in, the 1990, in the 1980s and 1990s. But since 2000, tax rates on software and capital, software capital and equipment capital is the two types of capital uh, that have been most in, involved in automation have come down a lot. Today, they are around 5%. This is because of tax reduction. Uh, the fact that the base of corporate income taxes has shrunk significantly because many companies have declared themselves to be S corporations exempt from capital taxation and also for generous depreciation allowances. So today, the US tax code creates a huge subsidy for firms to replace uh, workers with machines. This isn't an argument for wealth taxes. It's just an observation about where taxes have gone. And if you want to correct that, the most direct way of doing would be to go back more to what we used to do in the 1990s to broaden the base and the rates of corporate income taxes, for example, or, or, or close loopholes. But uh, but this has been one of the factors that has contributed to the greater emphasis on automation. Now, automation is not just a U.S. phenomenon. We have fairly good data for the OECD world, uh, and we see similar patterns. One way of seeing that is to look at what's going on in the employment structure. And here I'm showing changes in the employment rate of different occupations classified into three groups, bottom third, middle, and top. And the reason this is a particularly good classification is that the middle third in the OECD, as opposed to the developing world, which would be very different, <coughs> is contains essentially the quintessential uh, middle class occupations in offices, in clerical occupations, and especially blue collar occupations, assembly operators, welders, painters, and so on. And those are especially the tasks that are at the risk of automation and have been automated. So as a result, what you see is that in the US, you have this red bar pointing negative. These occupations have been uh, contracting quite strongly in the 1990s. But the same pattern is through pretty much in every OECD country. So these occupations have been disappearing. The problem is actually worse for emerging economies, such as India or Latin America, because their comparative advantage is in labor. So there is a sense in which automation technologies and AI, especially if it goes in the direction of uh, 
of, of, of more and more automation, it is going to be an inappropriate technology for the developing world. Let me expand on that point for a minute. I don't have too much time, but I think it is an important point. Many in this audience would be erudite enough to know the inappropriate technology literature. For example, uh, work by uh, Francis Stewart, and uh, as well as early work by Atkinson and Stiglitz, pointing out why capital intensive agriculture and manufacturing technologies that were important for the West may have been inappropriate for the developing world because they worked at factor ratios that were out of sync with the developing world. So it wasn't efficient for the developing world to use the same degree of capital to labor. And hence the technological advances that were taking place in the West were, may have been useless or not so useful for the developing world. I believe that literature was important and pointed out certain critical aspects of the development process. But today we have a much more ominous version of it because we're not talking about new technologies working at the wrong factor of proportions in the West from the viewpoint of the emerging world, but active automation and displacement of workers, both in the West and in the rest of the world. One way of understanding that is we are in a much more globalized world and many companies in India, in Vietnam, in Mexico, in Brazil are performing tasks that are then used in Germany, Switzerland, Japan, or the US. But to the extent that automation takes place in these advanced economies, it is indirectly taking tasks and jobs away from India, Mexico, Vietnam, Indonesia, and so on. We already see that, for example, when US companies adopt robots, that destroys jobs in Mexico among auto parts suppliers because they are being automated and now being done in-house in the United States. Or put it differently, the, the development path that South Korea or Taiwan developed in the 1960s based on uh, export-led production of first cheap tasks and then more middle tasks is now impossible because workers in the developing world wouldn't be competing against workers, more highly paid workers in the United States, but they would be competing against robots or algorithm. So that really changes what the future holds for the developing world. And that's the sense in which I said at the beginning that I think these issues of automation and AI are critical for countries like India, Mexico, Brazil, but are not receiving enough attention. And part of the co consequences of that, not that it's easy to reverse, is that when decisions about regulation or research in AI and how to use AI platforms are being made in the West, nobody from the developing world is at the table. And I think that has really important implications, especially when this inappropriateness point that is even more severe because jobs will be eliminated and the real comparative advantage of many of these emerging economies, which is abundant labor, is going to be wasted as a result of the direction of AI. I think these are important questions that we have to take into account. Now at this point, perhaps not people in the emerging world, but if you make these points to many people in the US in positions of power, either in companies or in the, in the, in the, in the government, they have a very uh, staple answer. Well, this is the direction of technology. You cannot do anything about it. You don't want to interfere with technology in any way. These technologies are so wonderful. They're gonna make us so rich, superhuman and super rich, and we can just distribute these gains. Well, actually, reality seems to be very different. Actually, we are going through some of the slowest productivity growth period in all of the world, especially in the developed world. 
and especially in the US. So you see the US, the TFP growth, total factor productivity growth in the US was in excess of 3% in the decades of the 1950s, uh, uh, around 2% in the 1960s. Today, it's around half a percent. So a complete disconnect between amazing rates of productivity gro uh, uh, growth of innovations and patents and very, very slow productivity growth. The developing world is no exception. Asia has somewhat decent productivity growth. This is now looking at labor productivity because I don't have the TFP for all these countries. Uh, and uh, Eastern Europe has decent productivity, but the rest of the world, including Western Europe, and especially uh, Middle East, Africa, and Latin America have very, very disappointing productivity growth. So whatever it is we're doing with technology, we're not getting the dividends out of it. And again, my evidence suggests, although this is harder to prove, that this is because of excessive automation. Now, the COVID world is deepening many of the problems, let alone the complete uh, unnecessary loss of innocent life over uh, almost a million and a half people around the world now. But one of the other things that it's doing is that it's actually exacerbating these problems. Companies have added one more item to the reasons why they want to automate social distancing vulnerability to the virus. People have become more troublesome. And in the US, more than 75% of companies say they have either taken steps for greater automation or have started planning for it. So the future is going to be one of further automation. Now, of course, as I said, labor market institutions are an important part of protecting labor. And we have to do more in the developed world and the developing world in order to protect labor, especially in the face of these changes. However, I want to make one conceptual point. If we leave the direction of technology as it is, towards more and more automation, using all of the AI and algorithms that have become much more wonderful for automation and replacing humans, there is nothing labor market institutions can do. In fact, on the contrary, if in the US today, with the labor market, with the direction of technology going the way it is, if you jack up the minimum wage to $18 an hour, what that will do is that it will actually encourage firms to e-automate even more. So labor market institutions are not a solution by themselves. They're part of the solution, but the important part is a redirecting technological change. So this is part again of my work over the last 10 years. I have been arguing that the direction of technology is very endogenous and moreover, it may be distorted for the reasons that I have mentioned, government research policy, government tax policy, and the business models of large corporations. And there is no technological law that says that the future has to be fully automated or that's the best way of organizing production. There's a lot of evidence that more productive ways of organizing technology exist and humans are more central to it than the business models of big tech today would suggest. So we have a possibility of greater human friendliness of technologies. And that's gonna be decided by company societies via government policies and regulations about how technology is used, how technology is developed, what its direction is going to be. But all of this would require a new institutional framework. Can we have a new institutional framework? Well. It's whatever that institutional framework is, and I'll say about that in a second, in the next slide, it's not easy to get there. We have already built various institutional aspects of the world economy and world politics and many malfunctioning aspects of it and reversing them is not going to be easy. Nevertheless, we are also in the midst of what James Robinson and I call the critical juncture in why nations fail. A time in which institutions are proven not to work, not to be up to the current challenges, which creates a room for major institutional change. Not a necessity, but a room for institutional change. And the direction of that institutional change is uncertain, contingent, dependent on leadership, dependent on societal actions and coalitions that will form in society. But at least there is that room. 
The pandemic has also deepened these institutional fault lines. We see three aspects of that already, and that I think all three of that, those aspects underscore the failures of US institutions, UK institutions, Brazilian institutions, and perhaps even in India, although of course people in this audience would be a much better judge of that, and I welcome and I look forward to hearing your comments on that. We have seen erosion of expertise and autonomy in institutions. For example, how spectacularly Central Center for Disease Control failed, which was much more successful in the past uh, when dealing with endemics. We have seen collapse of trust in institutions, and we have seen many aspects of democracy malfunctioning due to polarization, misinformation, democratic parties not really channeling the passions and ideas of people in the appropriate way. And as a result of all of these three things, we have seen more and more backpedaling in institutions with right-wing authoritarian leaders in the ascendancy in many countries, including India, in Brazil, in the US, in the UK, but also a lot of the institutional fabric of these societies becoming eroded. So let me skip that. Let me skip that as well, since I want to leave time for questions. So let me end with these next two slides. So I've said the underlying problems. I've explained the underlying problems. I've said uh, the I've set the scene for explaining why in any institutional change is not going to be easy. But in fact, what we need is probably much harder because my, if my prognosis is right, what we need is a new kind of welfare state. And this new kind of welfare state will need to deal with inequality which the old welfare state did, macroeconomic management, but also many global challenges, which I did not have time to talk about, climate change, pandemics, security. But most importantly, something that the old welfare state did not explicitly deal with or did not even have a roadmap for dealing with regulation of technology. So if you look at the what the architects of original welfare states had in mind, they were very worried about macroeconomic management. That's why Keynesian aspects were very important. People like Lord Beveridge were worried about poverty, inequality, and that's why minimum wages, national health insurance, social security, they were very, very important. But they didn't have to worry about technology because they were in the midst of a period in which already there were a lot of technologies. They was just a question of deploying these technologies. But if my prognosis is right, one critical role that the new welfare state will have to do is to redirect technological change. Take control of the AI process, for example, away from a handful of companies and take into account the interests of the people. And then there's a question, which people? Is it just the Americans and the Germans or also Indians and Mexicans? So how do we actually globally make sure that the Indians and the Mexicans and uh, and, and, and Vietnamese and Indonesians are also represented. So this means much greater burdens on the shoulder of the state. That comes with risks, many risks. Some of those were succinctly viewed by Frederick von Hayek, who, when reading the beverage report that came out in 1942, in the midst of the Second World War, was incensed and immediately shot a memo or letter to Beveridge, and then a, a, uh, a, a, a wrote that into a, uh, in the form of an essay, and then turned it into one of the most influential books of economics and politics in the 20th century. The Road to Serfdom. Hayek was no debutant. He understood that the state had to play an important role. He was not unconcerned about inequality as he was sometimes portrayed, but he was deeply worried about what greater <laughs> responsibilities for the state would mean, especially administrative controls for the state. Remember, what I'm saying here is much greater regulation of technology, something that Hayek would have been even more up in arms about. Hayek thought that the more limited ones that uh, 
Beveridge was proposing in some sense would be the end of Western democracy, a new, new road to serfdom, a road to totalitarianism like the one that he had experienced in Austria and Germany and he was seeing across the border in Russia. In the event, however, Hayek did not prove to be wrong. And one way of understanding that is through the concept introduced in my new book with Jim Robinson, The Narrow Corridor. And I'm not going to summarize the book, but I just want to borrow one figure from that book to convey one of the main ideas in that book and end with that in the current context. So the key object, objective of the book that James and I wrote is to understand the evolution of political institutions around the world and especially the role of the state and the balance between state and society. And this picture summarizes that argument. It has power of the state, capacity of the state to provide public services, but also to control society through repression and information gathering, and also through economic regulation. And on the horizontal axis, we have the power of society, collective action, coalition formation, democratic governance, media, and all of the other things that society does in order to govern itself, but also withstand the pressures from the state, also have a say in the state. Despotism such as the one in China or very weak or absent states in much of the world are commonplace. But the most interesting part of the space and the book, in our opinion, is what we call the narrow corridor here. What's that, what distinguishes the narrow corridor is a balance between power of the state and power of society. The, power, the state is powerful, but society is powerful so it can withstand the state's demands and can try to guide the state's direction, what the state is going to use, what the elites are going to use their power and capacity for. And the thing that happens that's almost miraculous in the corridor is that the dynamics, although tumultuous and potentially unstable, can still involve this co-evolution of the power of the state and society. The state shoulders in more responsibility, so becomes more powerful, potentially more repressive, but at the same time, society can get more powerful, democracy can get stronger, civil society can get bolder so as to counterbalance the state. And that is what we call the Red Queen because society and state have to both run very fast, just like in Lewis, and, uh, Lewis Carroll's Alice in the Wonderland, to keep up with each other. And that's the process that Hayek did not foresee. He did not see that as the welfare state came in, at the same time, Western democracies would become deeper, much more active, civil society would become much more assertive. And as a result, contrary to what Hayek predicted, the four decades that followed the uh, World War II, just like in the US, became the golden decades of Western democracies. They became much stronger, economic mm -hmm. growth became more productivity driven and inequality was contained and reduced creating shared prosperity. So therefore, there is nothing impossible for us to require an even more involved state as long as society also becomes bolder and more assertive. Of course, therein lies the problem. We have also made democracy much weaker. And some of the technologies that I have been mentioning and something else I have been investigating in my recent work, but I haven't had time to talk about, is that some of those technologies have also weakened democracy. So the real challenge for us is whether we can make democracy work much better in the face of the AI challenge and in the face of the challenge from right-wing autocrats and authoritarians that we have become so commonplace around the world in the face of polarization, so as we can prove Hayek wrong again and deal with the global and technological challenges of the next several decades with the right institutional architecture. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the comments and questions. Uh, thank you, Darren. Uh, great. So now, uh, can I ask uh, Professor Kosik Basu to you know, ask Darren something or uh, comments or something? He did mention shared prosperity towards the end, I remember. Ajit. Yeah, um, Ajit, thank you very much. Uh, and 
I should mention that um, I had told Ajit that I will be listening to this lecture. I was very keen, quietly. Ajit immediately offered me the space to ask a question right at the beginning if I wanted to. So I grabbed that spot. Thank you very much, Ajit. Thank you, all of you. And also, Daron, what a fantastic lecture. I really wanted to hear uh, quietly. But I, as it happens, I'm glad for this opportunity. I do have a question, but even before getting into the question, I want to allude to Ajit's um, initial uh, uh, comment on the timing vis-a-vis -vis the Nobel. I don't want to cause embarrassment, but we had a similar incident. Ajit, were you at all involved in 2007? Um, uh, Delhi School had involved, by then I had left Delhi School of Economics, but I was a bit um, uh, involved and maybe also the Institute of Economic Growth for Eric Maskin to come and give a lecture around the 16th or 17th of December. And as luck would have it, few days before that, it was announced that Eric Maskin was getting the Nobel. And I thought we've had it now. We'll never manage to get Eric, but Eric was actually amazingly gracious. He came straight from the Nobel ceremony to Delhi to give his lecture. And that's the only time I got to see a, a, a copy. Apparently that's what you're given of the Nobel Prize. Eric went up to his room and brought down a, that a facsimile of the Nobel Prize and showed it to us because he had come straight from there. So I, as you were talking, I was remembering this. Let me jump straight away into um, Daron's talk and the substance. I do believe actually this is a gripping problem for the world. And if we manage this wrong, it is a bit of an existential problems, uh, problem for human beings. So I'm glad by this attention. My question, the only question, is a bit of a disagreement with Daron about the last part, the prescriptive part. And I'll tell you what my concerns are. And I'll try to push you in a particular direction. And I want to see whether I can lean on you. The state, uh, I do believe uh, on the great importance of the state, we can't play it down. But a big state does worry me in one particular form that when a state becomes very big and powerful, if it could be that way and very fair, that's fine. But there is always a bit of a risk of that state being captured by a few big players. We call it crony capitalism. You can get crony capitalism with very few cronies. And at one level, that's what happened to USSR. The state became very powerful and the state got captured by a few players. So in fact, in the last phase of that big state, it's very difficult to sort of distinguish between a socialist state and a crony capitalist state because it gets captured. Given that risk, my own inclination, Daron, is uh, it should be a small state, but a redistributive state. And the redistribution has to take the following form. The direction of the flow of technology, you're right that it is actually shameful that decisions get taken in rich countries and there are no spokespersons from Africa, from Asia and Latin America to give it shape. But maybe we will never succeed in that. The technology will continue on its march, in which case the right thing to do would be, in my opinion, take away a part of the profit that goes to the private sector and distribute it like shares to the larger population. So it can get as mechanized as possible, profit can get heaped, but if that pro right to that profit is shared, widely distributed, because there is shareholding of profit widely dispersed, a lot of the evil gets mitigated. And this is an idea, of course, goes back to one of your co uh, colleagues a uh, long time ago, Marty Weitzman and others writing, but there's a revival. So I feel somehow it should be a small state but the state and the profit motive still continues. A large part of the private sector is running on profit, but a part of it is taken away and given to workers who have been displaced. They are living, the workers will then begin to live like feudal lords, nothing shameful in that. They have right to the profit that is being produced. So it's the prescriptive part which was worrying me, but otherwise, as since there's an audience primarily from India, I should also add that Daron's range of work is just absolutely fascinating, staggering from pure technical work to work of this kind of importance. Daron, thank you very much for the lecture. And I would love you to address a little bit on the normative prescriptive part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Kaushik. Uh, and those are, of course, very valid concerns. I do not belittle the concerns at all. Uh, however, I am not 
either a fan or an optimist about the possibility of letting technology have its course and then uh, redistributing it. Several reasons. First of all, there isn't, in my opinion, I'm repeating something I said, but more expanding on, there isn't a natural course of technology. It's not as if, if we let things happen as they are, the right type of technology is going to get developed. And in fact, the evidence that I was emphasizing on productivity tells me that we, there are already distortions. So we would never solve those distortions. We will never solve the fact that we may have gotten onto the wrong path of technology. The second problem with letting technology develop as it is, and then, uh, uh, and then try to redistribute is that it's not, it may be politically impossible. In the past, what enabled redistribution was often the fact that those who needed redistribution had political power. It was things like unions. Unions were important because they could strike. Humans were relevant. Once humans cease to be relevant, how is it that they are going to have the power to make sure that that redistribution happens? And what we are seeing in many countries is that, in fact, even today, that redistribution is very, very difficult to make a reality. Trade was promised to bring benefits, and then the benefits would be shared. That's not what happened. Same thing with technology. And then the final element here is that, in fact, I am also quite pessimistic that a world uh, where people are more and more jobless, and we're not going to get there anytime soon. I'm not saying that in the next 20 years we're going to create mass unemployment, but increasingly more people not able to be part of social networks and the social context of job, which is often defining for most humans, would be actually a healthy or a sustainable world. So I think there are many problems with the sort of the view that, you know, in the U.S., in Silicon Valley is sort of uh, uh, is, a, is an opt techno-optimistic UBI view, for example. You create a generous universal basic income, and that's, uh, that sort of leads to the gains from technology being shared. I don't think that's a reality, and I think it's actually quite dystopic. Finally, Kaushik, I think you are absolutely right. I think the real challenge, which is much, much harder than I made it out to be, is how are we going to make sure that people from India, people from Brazil and Mexico and Vietnam are at the table? But that is the critical thing. I think we really need more voices at the table. That's the way you stop governments being captured. It's not just institutions and checks and balances, but more diversity. And that's what, for example, Western Europe and to some degree the U.S. achieved in the 50s and the 1960s. But also I think the developing world is not powerless. You know, I, there is a debate about the broader social implications of green, tech, uh, green revolution. But the green revolution was precisely the, uh, the developing world saying, well, you're not producing the right technologies for us. We're going to be at the table by creating our own institutions and then working to the extent that possible with the Western institutions, but led by Indians and Mexicans. I think what was done in the context of the Green Revolution is more critical today. It's harder, but it's more critical. So I don't really want the developing world to give up that fight. Thank you, Darren. Uh, Darren, we have something from uh, maybe a question from Nosad Forbes. Uh, I must tell you that Nosad is, is a corporate leader. Okay. So you're probably addressing uh, the corporate report. No, sir. So uh, first of all, Darren, uh, thank you very much for a, indeed a wonderful presentation um, and, uh, and also uh, wonderful books. Uh, I have, thank I have, you. I have a question on, um, you know, in terms of dealing with technology uh, and it seems to me that the, your main criticism is targeted at what one would call the Anglo-Saxon model. And um, there is also a question in the chat about Germany. Uh, and then I have a point uh, on Japan. And I wonder whether Germany and Japan and the way in which they deal with these same issues is uh, uh, it provides some insight into a way of handling these kinds of, uh, these kinds of points. So for example, for Germany, where they invest a lot in, uh, in worker training, uh, where uh, there is a certain degree of stickiness, uh, where firms will not just be allowed to, uh, to vanish and put people out of work. Uh, you know, municipalities will step in and, um, and, and, and keep, uh, keep an, 
turn a turn and turn a large company that's gone out of business into an industrial estate and try and sustain employment and so on. You know, that kind is that kind of a future uh, a way of addressing this. Um, and then second, uh, if you look at Japan, where you have you know very high productivity in manufacturing, especially sort of more modern manufacturing, but you have uh, supposedly uh, a very low, a lower productivity services sector, which comes in usually for a lot of criticism um, by, uh, by, by, by West, Western economists. Um, but it's a very high service culture. And anyone who's traveled around Japan knows how much of a pleasure it is to experience that very high service culture. Um, so, you know, is, is that kind of a framework, you know, for a, a Japan with a high service culture sitting on top of, and maybe low labor productivity, sitting on top of a high productivity manufacturing base, or a Germany which is working very hard at, uh, uh, at, at, at worker retraining, is, is that a potential way of addressing uh, this issue of uh, technology choice that uh, that you're talking about and uh, of dealing with automation uh, in thank you Navsha that's a great question and uh, yes the answer is yes and but with some complications so first of all uh, let me say uh, something I started saying in response to Kashik Kashik's question we need we will we need a multipolar world when it comes to geopolitics, but also when it comes to technology and economic regulation. And, you know, one pole is of course gonna be the US or the Anglo-Saxon world, so to speak. One is obviously China, but we need two more. What I've said before, the developing world, I think needs to be at the table and India cannot do it alone. Mexico cannot do it alone. Brazil cannot do it alone. Unfortunately, all three of these countries are completely dysfunctional at the moment politically, but somehow that has to be overcome and these countries and several others need to get together. And then the fourth one is European Union. And European Union has a very central role. They have been at the forefront of issues such as privacy and regulation of AI and technology. They have a different model and where the welfare state has made important uh, uh, has, 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 has had some big setbacks in, in the Euro European countries as well, but is still much stronger. And the evidence is that, you know, uh, it's not a panacea, but exactly like you said, there are ways in which you can do that better. So the German evidence suggests that when you introduce robots, uh, the, it has the same displacement effects, but many German companies are then able to reassign these workers to non-production jobs, and that is related to training. And the municipalities are able to create a much better social safety net, some, uh, dulling some of the negative effects. But the problem is that European Union or European countries, I should say, and Japan are also aging much faster. What that means is that actually, although they have a much more nuanced approach to some of these new technologies, automation is an imperative for them. So they can be counted on perhaps for regulating big companies and doing better automation, but they are going to be at the forefront of automation. In fact, in industrial robotics, for example, Japan and Germany are far ahead of the United States. There's nothing wrong with them doing that because they need it. But it also means that on the concept of automation, they're not going to be a complete counterweight, only a partial counterweight to the US. And that's why, again, the developing country as part of the multipolar world being at the table is really imperative. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, Nosad. Uh, well, there are lots of questions, 32 uh, in my last count. Uh, obviously, if I'm just going to read them out, it's going to be you know, 10 o'clock Indian time. So I'm going to take one more question. Uh, my colleague, Prabhakar Sau. Prabhakar. Thank you so much, Professor Mr. Thank you, Professor Asma Blue. It was uh, really interesting and uh, we are really grateful. Uh, I have two small points. One clarification, basically, you showed the uh, you know, wage bills going down in USA, uh, basically blaming that automation alone is responsible for the employment loss or lower demand for the labor force. But if we uh, go back to you know, Susan Hosman's uh, findings, that large number of farms have been closed down. So if it was automation, they should have been there and productivity would have gone up, which your data actually don't show. So is it right to really blame automation alone 
not the foreign competition, particularly from China, that has affected the labor demand. So the OS bill. And the second is a bit general question, but it is related to this. Uh, look, uh, this pandemic has affected the world economy. Of course, it will take two years. By the end of 2021, we'll get back to the world GDP of 2019. It has affected the informal sector, MSMEs, retail trade, so your labor intensive. So large number or millions of people will go below poverty line and it will also kind of aggravate the inequality which has been increasing as uh, your data also shows. The services sector, the modern services or the business, finance, insurance, hotel, tourism and all that, uh, they, they really observe large number of women. In fact, 58% of the total women work in uh, services sector. So what we are looking at is more gender inequality, inequality in general, because of labor intensive sectors are badly affected, and also services, those who provide job opportunities for the women. So more gender inequality. At the same time, uh, this pandemic also affected uh, so-called what you call the globalization, the anti-globalization OS, uh, and also the hyper nationalism has got more activated or escalated because of this pandemic. So it would uh, deny the market access to the developing countries as well as to the lower income countries. Those who are just uh, the, those who are there uh, doing this, uh, you know, export of commodities. So post COVID scenario, we are staring or looking at a situation uh, are looking at a world which is very divergent, the difference of the gap between the South and North is higher, more inequality, uh, particularly gender inequality, and also the poverty. So if you suggest some specific policies to the world leaders, like we'll have G20 summit uh, next weekend and 21st, 22nd, or to the policy makers, how do we really address all this basic economic questions like inequality, poverty, and gender inequality also. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Prabhakar. Let me, uh, this time is short. Let me actually, I mean, I agree with the second, and I think on the policy advice, I think it's a much more institutional advice, as I'm suggesting that's necessary. But on the first one, let me say, I did not mean to suggest that automation was responsible for all or even most of the job losses. In fact, three technological, sorry, three economic currents have been very important in the US labor market. It's competition, especially from China and final goods, imports from China, offshoring, partly to China, but partly to Mexico, partly to, uh, you know, in, in Indonesia, India, Vietnam, and so on, and automation. If you look at uh, job losses, employment losses, uh, the Chinese imports have actually played a role. For example, in a recent in a paper that I wrote with David Otter, Gordon Hansen, and uh, and David Dorn, we estimate that in total it may have cost about 1.5 million jobs. However, uh, global competition in the form of import seems to have a very small role in inequality. So inequality is much more about this task structure where offshoring and automation have played a much more of an important role. That's what our estimates show. And that's why I was emphasizing automation because I was also linking the slowdown in labor demand to, uh, to, to inequality. And moving forward, offshoring and automation are very closely linked and hence uh, part of my emphasis on this sort of task displacement coming from automation, which auto offshoring is having a similar effect. And, and as you said, I think the changes due to COVID are actually exacerbating that trend. Uh, thank you, Darren. Uh, thank you, Provaka. Thank you, uh, everybody. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to send all the questions to Lauren. Yep. Thank you. That will be fantastic. Yeah. So, so you know, and then you can... Uh, address them uh, leisurely. Uh, now, I'm, I'm, Moshimi, you please take over. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Darren. This was a fantastic talk. I suppose, you know, everybody enjoyed and there are 
issues that in about institution, state, and society. Can state influence the society through, through cultural aspect? Uh, that's an interesting thing that came up towards the end. You didn't talk about it, but that seemed to be happening around the world. Uh, and that's something that we'll also have to tackle. Uh, now, um, I would request uh, Mr. N.K. Singh to say a few words. Uh, our chief guest, uh, Mr. Singh. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first, let me say how much and how deeply I have enjoyed this uh, outstanding presentation by Darren. He knows that, uh, you know, I think that he has raised some very far reaching uh, issues which have a much wider ramification on both for the economic and, uh, and, and social patterns in a post pandemic world. He used, of course, this nice expression of a new kind of welfare state. Now, I know that many have talked about the need for a reset buttons. Others have talked about uh, the principal ingredient of this new kind of welfare state uh, to be a new social contract uh, that uh, people like uh, Manu Shafiq, who have written this lovely book, Director of the London School of Economics, on the ingredients of a new social contract which would be integral to uh, this new kind of, of, of a welfare state you talked about. I have uh, just uh, two issues uh, which I, I, I want to raise, I, I want to comment on. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to comment on the fact that, uh, yes, this higher test between uh, higher levels of technology uh, with, with associated with automation and the displacement of employment uh, in India is an exceedingly urgent issue of a high priority. Uh, now, on the one hand, we know that employment rates in India um, are something which, about which we need not be very, uh, very proud about, uh, particularly the fact that uh, large scale uh, employment uh, in the informal sector is very difficult to to reckon with numerically and methodology on employment estimation in the informal sector remains exceedingly weak and, and problematic. But notwithstanding that, uh, uh, the first big issue is that uh, even while this could broadly be true that uh, the gains in productivity are significantly lower than um, the, the, the downside of uh, employment displacement to adoption of uh, higher forms of uh, technology, particularly uh, the adoption of uh, 5G and the associated artificial intelligence, which, which goes with it. But the fact remains that a country like India is, is fairly, fairly keen in embracing artificial intelligence in terms of its multiplier effects on health, uh, on education, on agriculture in terms of uh, what it can do um, in agricultural productivity in the belief perhaps that the two taken together, the, the aspects of enhanced productivity, it would be significantly higher than the aspects of employment displacement or the, the tardiness with which uh, new jobs and new kinds of job opportunities, some of which of course, uh, uh, Naushad also alluded to in the, in the services sector. So this is one broad area of concern that since uh, it doesn't offer you too much of a choice or whether you want to embrace or not, because if you are part of the belief of the post-Washington consensus, which has driven post-World War globalization in general, in terms of a quest for a global value added chain, then you want to be part of the global value added chain, you must demonstrate higher levels of competitive efficiency which means the whole issue of labor efficiency and so on comes into play. And this really remains. So if, if globalization in the manner in which we have understood globalization in the first world war period is to be retempered or recalibrated, uh, that's another matter. But right now, I do not think that uh, uh, countries like India, which have high problems of employment, also have a choice uh, in terms of uh, shutting themselves off to high levels of technological excellence. No, these are not, this is notwithstanding the need for a regulatory framework, which enables really 
a more calibrated dissemination of this technology and what kind of a regulatory framework would balance out the need not to stifle creativity and innovation, something that Darren also mentioned, along with some of the other adverse consequences. I'll leave this aspect there. The second broad issue, which uh, I want to just raise and, and flag, is last year, when I had the privilege of uh, delivering the Foundation Day lecture, I did talk about the issues of global governance, uh, something that Darren has also touched on uh, somewhat briefly, although that how do you improve the quality of global governance? Central to the improvement of global governance is the future of multilateral institutions. Now, if in the current uh, framework, all multilateral institutions, which were created in the post-World War period, with singular example being the WTO, are, it looks to me to be in a, in a state of seminal decline. The World Bank and the International Monetary Fund as the two major Bretton Woods institution also seems to be skewed up in terms of its governance structure. The United Nations in general remains unreformed, uh, notwithstanding the quest of uh, many developing countries to make at least the Security Council a little more democratic than it is to be apart from the General Assembly. Now, unless global governance structures are reformed with much higher priority and speed, for which you require a different kind of collective global will, I think some of these problems that Taran has pointed out will remain problems which will haunt us increasingly as higher levels of technology begin to in fact suppress the aspects of freedom of choice on technology options. I stop here because I think that uh, the outstanding uh, uh, lecture given by Darren has raised many fundamental issues of economic and social reform, which would be high priority for a, a country like India, uh, which wants to achieve high levels of economic growth, high levels of employment, and of course, uh, try and see what it can do to address the endemic issues of poverty and all those uh, things associated with high levels of poverty. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you. Thanks a lot. And I wish Thank you this, very much. Uh, lecture, this lecture can be circulated uh, and put on the website because the IG would be doing enormous service and as a trustee I plead with the director that uh, uh, if this lecture can be shared with some of us I think that it has raised some very far-reaching points uh, which uh, are on a medium-term relevance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, Mr. Singh. Uh, Darren would you like to respond uh, to Mr. Singh's uh, comments? No I, I completely agree and uh, I think precisely why precisely because India, as well as many other emerging economies, cannot shield themselves or come out of the international division of labor that the inappropriateness of technology is such a critical challenge. Yes, absolutely. Before you proceed, Mausumi, just uh, since Mr. Singh has raised about the, 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 you know, the lecture being put on the website, Darren, this is being recorded, so are you happy for us? I'm to completely happy for it to be on the website. I'll be delighted. Great. That's terrific. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, um, everybody. I think, you know, after this fantastic lecture, it's now we have come towards the end of this program. So uh, uh, there are many exciting questions, but unfortunately, we can't take them up due to paucity of time. So may I now ask um, um, Mr. Das, um, Mr. Tarun Das, our chairman, IG, to give the vote of thanks. Um, Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Mosman. Thank you very much. Uh, Darren, this is an ideal Foundation Day lecture. We had an amazing Foundation Day lecture last year by Mr. N.K. Singh. And you have, you have come up to the same level in provoking thought, in sharing knowledge, in your passion, and in your articulation. It, it's wonderful to have this second lecture at this level, and I congratulate Ajit Mishra for persuading you, inviting you, cajoling you to get you here. It's been terrific. And thank you for agreeing to 
have your lecture on the website. Um, I will not join issue with you about some of your references to India, but I would definitely ask Ajit to see if we can get you for a short offline conversation about India, because I think there are some of us who live in India, uh, some of us have studied abroad, but came back to India, uh, may have some perceptions to share with you. Uh, you are probably very exposed to some of your neighbors who are offshore, uh, <laughs> offshore residents of this country and who are my friends also. But uh, if you have the time sometime at your leisure, I will be delighted. We would love to have a off the record private conversation with you about what's happening in India, pluses and minuses, our challenges and our opportunities. So we leave that aside and thank, thank you for your immediate uh, positive response. Um, you know, you have shared thoughts, knowledge, ideas. Uh, you, you provoked us to think about new ideas like the new welfare state, um, which seems so difficult as, uh, as um, Mr. N.K. Singh pointed out about when he talked about global governance and global will. But what I really take away is your passion and, and your, your amazing articulation of your thoughts and your ideas. So thank you very much for doing this. We are most grateful. And I think everybody on this audience will share what I say. I'm also delighted that we have Mr. N.K. Singh with us, uh, our trustee, uh, our speaker last year at the Foundation Day Lecture, always thoughtful, always uh, knowledgeable. And as the chairman of the 15th Finance Commission, uh, he has had a huge role to play in shaping how India goes in the next you know, several years uh, going forward. And maybe one day, Darren, you will have access to at least the executive summary of what, what he has recommended uh, to the President of India and the Government of India on that. So to both of you, uh, grateful thanks from IEG. And finally, to Ajit, to Moshumi, to Andrila and your team and your colleagues, uh, thank you for putting this together. And Koshik, great to have you here. Naushad, uh, also for being here with us as a trustee of IEG. Uh, it's been a great evening. We are bang on time and I hand you back to, I don't know, Moshimi or Ohindra, whoever, one of the ladies will conclude now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending the lecture. Thank you, Darren. It was you know, wonderful to have you here. And we really, really hope to have you here physically, you know, in sometime in future. I look forward to that. When we can talk more about uh, our country, uh, your country, which is, you know, current residence, US, and your or country where you came from, Turkey, where things are going in a very, you know, in, in, where, as I said, state, society, culture, they're all mixed up. And at some point, we have to probably sit together and disentangle them uh, for the future growth. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending this lecture. And uh, so uh, over to you, Ajit, to end this program. Well, no, no, no. I'll just say it. thank you again to everybody. Thank you, Mr. Das. You did thank you yourself for being always with us. And then... Uh, thank you, Mr. Singh. You know, uh, after some time, probably, you know, I will forget to say welcome, Mr. Singh, because I consider you now an internal member of IEZ. Thank you. Thank and you. and, and uh, it's, it's great to have you here, Darren. Thank you again. Thank you very thank much. You. Yeah. yeah. And thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Uh, I'm going to end the meeting. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for thank you. inviting me, and it was a great pleasure to have this conversation. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Darren. Thank you very much.